So let's uh, begin. And the, the mic is there. In Proverbs 18:16, it says, a, "A person's gifts, a person's gift opens door for him, and brings him before the great." What is the difference between this and bribing, or isn't this bribing? Well, bribing, goodwill is different from bribing. Uh, bribing is an outright intention. You want to get something. Gift is different. Uh, say, for example, you give somebody a Christmas gift. You don't give them a birthday gift. You don't, you don't especially a birthday gift. You don't give them a birthday gift thinking that uh, you will receive a birthday gift from them. It's just a birthday gift. And so, I mean, just think about giving children gifts. But that actually will, will make room for you in the future because that gift... You have to remember that the, uh, the Greek word for gift is uh, where we get the word grace. It's charis. And so what, hap what happens is when you give a, a gift, it generates grace. That's natural. Anybody who gives you a gift, it generates grace. Unless the person is ungrateful, then it doesn't generate grace. But, but a gift generates grace pro uh, from the one that is uh, receiving your gift. And so it will make room. By the way, uh, what, what you have to distinguish, though, is the protocol. For example, in, uh, in Proverbs, it talks about kings, and that is closely related to bribery in the, in the other chapters because the other thing, there is there's no context on the passage. It is protocol when you are seeing a king that you, give, you bring a gift. I mean, unless it's a, in, in the early days, there will be consultations, there will be problem solving that the kings have with the people, like the one, remember the two uh, women that uh, Solomon says is split. It's common for those things. However, when, when uh, the commoners are meeting with the king, they also bring their gifts. They bring their produce, they bring their livestock. It's very common. Uh, and that is where we get the, the statement from the scriptures do not present yourself before the Lord empty-handed. Why? He's the king of kings. That's just the way it is. You don't present yourself empty-handed before a king. That's just how it is. You always bring something before the king. That may not, may not be uh, uh, money, of course, but uh, in kind of other things. But that generates grace by itself. Yeah. In Jeremiah 1, chapter 8, in Jeremiah chapter 1, uh, God told Jeremiah, what do you see? And, and Jeremiah said, an almond tree. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere there it says that, for I am watching over my words. Can you please explain that? Bet the, the relationship between the almond tree and God saying, I am watching I over that, my word. I, I explained that before. But I, I forgot the relationship with the almond tree. Uh, almond tree has something to do, I think, when I was explaining it years ago. I still I, I explained that, in fact, during my transition team meeting. Uh, almond tree speaks of the strength and the vitality of its roots, uh, if I remember well. But uh, when God says, I'm watching over it, because through trials and difficulties, the almond prevails. And so what happened is, when God is watching, he's making sure that that tree thrives. And so when God says something to us, and of course we receive it in faith, God watches over that to make sure it happens. That's why you don't let go of the promise of God in your life. The moment God gives a word to you, he watches it. Uh, and, and this is something that, that I have been working on. Maybe I'll do a short series on this one, on the, on the gift of grace. Because one thing that I found out is this. Uh, when God gives you a gift and you already received the gift, all you need to do is to unpack it. Because I'm observing some ministers, for example, with multiple gifts. Some of them operate in those gifts with fear, but they still operate, and it used to bewilder me. And then I begin to realize that a gift is like that. Even if the moment, for example, if I give, if I give him this gift, saying, I, I have a problem with my throat. So I said, I'll give you this. And you may say, well, I don't believe that. You take it in. 
even without faith, this will work for you. Because that's already a grace. And that's, I think, one aspect of, uh, of grace that we are yet to see. There's, there's some things that I'm seeing in the scriptures right now that, that uh, really was blurry before, but, but it's amazing to me right now. And, and that is correlated with that because when God gives you a, a gift, say, say, say on my part, a calling, I will be the first one to tell you that uh, I, did not, I did not operate with maskers and faith all the time. I told you when I flew here to the, to the U.S., I was so anxious because I was sick. My interview with the INS was uh, so long. And finally, when I was going through all of those miracles, I was talking with uh, Andrew Murray, not the author, okay, but namesake. And he looked at me and says, brother, you have such great faith. The first answer that I gave him is no. <laughs> I, really didn't, I really didn't feel the faith in those days. It's the grace that carries me. It's a gift. God gave me a gift. I, I took it. I unveiled it. And, and it's all there for the taking. And I think we, we misunderstood that. And, and so if you look at Israel, take, for example, the, the one that the, new, the series that we just finished, Signpost. I mean, tell me, was Israel operating in faith when they became a nation in one day? They're still backsliding this day. But that is a gift that God gave to Abraham. That one day I will call back my people. That is a gift of grace. By the way, when Jesus returns, because the moment they believe, they believe in the Christ, then they will be born of God. That's what the Bible says. Look, is Israel going to be full of faith when Jesus returns? No. Now, make, make the difference. This, it is a big distinction <coughs> between us and Jews. The Jews are waiting for a human Messiah, <clears throat> not divine. And so the Messiah that we have is not their Messiah. They rejected Jesus, that's what the Bible says. Now can you imagine they will be pushed in the corner in the last days, and we're seeing it right now. By the grace of God, they will pray. Now, their prayer will not be full of faith. They'll just be crying to their God, the God of their fathers. And the Bible says, God will pour out the spirit of prayer and supplication. That's, these are not prayerful people. But the moment the spirit of grace is given to them, they will start praying. And then, they will almost be annihilated and Jesus will return and they will see him and they will be born again in one day. None of that is a product of their faith. They will believe when they see him, but him coming, they don't believe that, you know. So it's, it's the gift that was given. And when God is watching over his word to us, sometimes we think all, all we got to do is to believe. I'm, I'm telling you from experience and from what I have observed, the grace of God works with us even without, without our faith. Now we take that gift by faith. That's why we are saved by grace through faith, because it's the grace of God, it's the gift of God. Uh, unearned, unmerited, undeserved. It's, it, all you got to do is a faith to receive it, and it's going to be yours, you know. Yes, some of the promises that, that is happening <clears throat> in, our, in our marriage, in our lives, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that because I'm full of faith. I, just, just the house. My, my wife testified to you when we received a $5,000 winning from uh, Citibank. I wouldn't, I, it's already mine. I wouldn't deposit it. I don't believe it's real. I already got it. It's, it says $5,000, my name on it. And I refuse to deposit it for two weeks. But it's already there. Now, do I believe that money? No, I didn't. And then I deposited it. It cleared. I still won't spend it. <laughs> because I still, I said, there must be a catch. These understandings that I have is, is mighty grace of God. That's why all we have to do is to take it. And like that almond tree, strong, it's not going to be killed. It's going to happen. Whatever promises God gave to you, he, he observed. as long as we will clarify some of this in, in the pieces of John, as long as you don't walk away from that faith life, because the moment you walk away from the faith life, you're walking from his grace, because you can walk away from that grace. Like the check that we received, if I did not encash it, 
it's there, it's mine, but I'm not going to spend it. You know, so it's the same way. Next. Can you please explain what the psalmist meant in Proverbs 30, verse 18? What is so amazing about the way of an eagle in the sky, the way of a snake in a rock, the way of a ship at sea? What, what Proverbs is that? 30, verse 18. And the way of a man with a young woman. Oh. Well, 30, verse 18. Three things which are too wonderful for me. Yes, poor which I do not understand. The way of eagle in the air, the way of a serpent on the rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a virgin. So what's the question? Can you explain what is so amazing about those things? What? Can you please explain what is so amazing about you don't have to the way of an eagle in the sky? No, there's, there's no depth here. It's just an observation. I mean, are, are you not amazed a bird can fly? Are you not amazed that a 20 ton ship will float on the water? Are you not amazed when a man woes a woman, how that woman will be on the tip of his little finger? That's an amazing thing. The, the, the uh, wise man, not the psalmist, the wise man here is just looking at these things that are beyond comprehension. You can't fully explain it. I mean, can you, can you really explain why a bird can fly? And you say, well, because of, of, but it's, some of these birds are very heavy. And they can carry, they can carry animals that are heavy as well. It's an amazing thing, you know. There's nothing to explain there. <laughs> Go ahead. Even though we should avoid thoughts that wage war against our soul, example, Wondering if we did or said the right thing, does, th does this mean we can't reflect on what we said or did? What is the difference? Oh, we are told to reflect upon our ways. But uh, when it talks about waging war, that's being double-minded in your souls, if you remember the teaching. Because all of us, well, we have a body, we, we, have, a, we have a spirit. Oh, no, we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. And our soul needs to be renewed. There will really be conflict. But you, there comes a point your spirit rules your life that is not really a conflict. It's just a temptation. It's just a trial. Like, like, like for example, I, I, feel, I feel sleepy. Okay? And my body says, because I'm still jet lagged, uh, I'm, I'm going to bed between 3.30 to 5 in the morning. Uh, now, what happens is that around 6, 7 p.m., I doze up around 10 minutes. Then I'm okay, you know. Well, I was sitting down there, and I'm telling you, I'm very sleepy. But there is no conflict in my mind whether I, whether I will go home. You see what I'm saying? My body is telling me uh, I want to sleep. But absolutely no conflict. There's no war in my soul whether I will stay in the service or not. I am staying this a gathering of the saints, I am coming. Same thing on Sundays. Last Sunday, I went to church without sleep. That's, I slept in the office at around 2 p.m., but because of my, of my jet lag. But that, there's not even a hint, that shall, shall, I go in the, shall I go for the 5 a.m. prayer meeting? It's a, in fact, last, last Sunday, one of those earlier than usual, I came here at 4.28, but I, I could not sleep. So instead of being here at 5, 5.30, I was here at 4.28. You see, it's not an issue. But I am entertaining thoughts, I want to sleep. I want to sleep. And I was saying, I wish by 7.30 or 8, I'll be falling asleep in my office. But never a question on whether I'm going to go to church or I'll give the service to another person. That's the same thing. Your mind will always be bombarded with other thoughts. But it doesn't mean they prevail on you. When they are prevailing on you, that's when division takes place in your life. But I have to remember all of the suggestions will always come your way because you're human. And the earth is full of suggestion. It's how established your spirit is. When your spirit is established in the truth, that's, that's, a, that's a horse vision. I'm going there. Now, hey, be careful. Of course you will entertain that, but I'm going there. We went to missions, right? The only thing 
it's not a question of whether I'm going to missions or not. If people say, well, pastors say you're full of unbelief because of COVID, you not go there. No, I'm not full of unbelief. I just don't want the quarantine. Yeah. Uh, for, for example, in, in some places, people are hesitant. They still put on their mask. I, I never put my mask on unless my, my driver tells me, Pastor Sib, got to put my mask. It's not, I'm, I'm trying to cater to the uh, fear of others, but that's not an issue to me. You see, I'm not double minded on that one. But I'm single minded on this one. I don't want to be quarantined for two months. I'm not going to waste money and time in the Philippines being quarantined from one city or the other. So when that quarantine was removed by Bong Bong Marcos, I fly right away. You see? Uh, you, your minds will always be bogged down by other thoughts. To the day you die, it will happen. But your mind, your heart must be established, the Bible says, trusting in the Lord. No matter what those thoughts suggest, never allow them to war in your mind because you're, 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 you're thought established. And is my wife. I don't care how much we fight. I don't care if, if I think she becomes mean to me or she, I, be, I become mean to her. Divorce is never something that I entertain in my mind. She entertained it once, to my knowledge at least once, but not to me. It's not something that I entertain. We, we always argue, but not, not that one. Okay? Meaning, it doesn't matter how many thoughts or suggestions I have, I am fixed on that one. I'm also fixing other counseling that I do concerning those issues. No matter what the decision is, my mind is fixed on those things. Okay? So you will never get rid of multiple thoughts. It's where your heart is fixed in. Okay? When someone very dear to your heart does you wrong or offends you deeply, or if someone is repeatedly doing wrong or offending you, how can you prevent your heart from getting bitter? And what do you do about it? You stop making a fool of yourself, okay? You fool me once, you're the fool. You fool me twice, I am the fool. You fool me three times, then I'm really stupid, you know? Uh, what I'm saying is, you see, our temptation is, our Christian character is being questioned. Our love is being questioned. Well, if you truly are a Christian, if you truly love me, well, you will just let it go. No, that's a wrong question. Uh, if your heart is established and your heart doesn't condemn you, you're okay. So in spite, you will notice, in spite of the so many criticisms that, that I receive, I, I hold firmly to my beliefs based on the scriptures. Okay? Uh, if aunt tells me, I'll be there on time. I said, okay. And she was late. I said, what makes you think I should believe you next time? She's late again. This time when she comes, I'll be early. I said, prove it. I'm not going to, I am not going to plan my schedule on her being on time. Now, am I mean to her? It sounds mean to you, but not to me. You see, I'm not going to let her fool me saying that she is an on-time person. No, she's not. I have nothing against her, but she's not an on-time person. Now, she, she, one of the surprises tonight, she's not on time. She's early. That's a pleasant miracle. Does it move my opinion of her? No. She's got to do it consistently for me to move my opinion of her. Because she has consistently proven herself to be late. So what, why will I let her fool me on that area? You know what I'm saying? But do I hate her? No. I love her dearly. But she, it's just that she's, I mean, she will prepare everybody. And the moment everybody's prepared, almost late, then she will say, I'll take a shower. And I'll tell her, why, why won't you take a shower earlier? Because, you know, when I'm preparing, I take my shower, I'm ready to go. Well, she refused to change. So what? If, if I believe she will change that way after seeing all of this, now that they'll be making a fool out of me. So now, somebody is very dear to you. Let them earn back your trust without hating them. Yeah. Let them earn back your trust. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a wrong demand because that is just being like God. We are fools, for example, when somebody takes advantage of us and we keep allowing them to take advantage of us. 
we go beyond fools. We become stupid that way. That's why they laugh at us. Same, same thing with re, any, any kind of relationship. Now again, I, I, I really don't hate people because if I hate people, then I will, I'll, I'll disqualify myself from the race. But it's just that now, <laughs> look, I have given advice to people and my wife will tell me, do you think they'll do anything about it? I said, no. Why do you keep giving advice? Because I love them. But they will not do it. And she will look and say, you're right, they did not do it. I said, I told you. But it is my, my love duty to keep giving right counsel. Even as God will always remind, of, of, remind us of his word. But this is, this, is, uh, this is why I don't get bitter, really. It will always hurt, but I don't get bitter. Because I know man's character. I'm one. You know, I know man's character. When, when, you, when you're established like that, you'll come to a point, things around you don't move you really that much. Yeah, it, it, it really doesn't. That's why, you know, one of the churches that I'm, we're helping was very concerned about the audience this November. I said, no, I want to help your church. I said, I don't care if there are 10 people in the seminar. If it's your leadership, I'll go for it. Crowd doesn't move me. You see what I'm saying? Uh, you ha it's a very strong doctrine in the Bible. Your heart has got to be established. Um, the one who will hurt you the most are the ones whom you love the most. Okay? That's a fact. The ones whom you love the most are the ones who will grieve you the most and hurt you the most. That's just a fact. But if your heart is established and your strength is in God, you can make a stronger stand and you will overcome those. You know, do, do, I, uh, do I still get hurt by people all the time? But my heart is stronger than that. You know, so that's just the way it is. Uh, you, you mature yourself in the, perhaps that, that be, that's because of the amount of time that I spend the word whenever I'm disappointed. I'll, I'll go to the word and, and strengthen myself in, the, because that's the solution of the Bible. Strengthen yourself in the Lord, not in other people. If, for example, DJ disappoints me, I'm not going to strengthen myself in the promise of DJ. If DJ say, oh, Papa, I will not hurt you. I will not do this. I'm not going to strengthen myself on that one. That will be wrong. The Bible says, strengthen yourself in the Lord. So I go to the Lord, I look at his word, and I will know exactly how to deal with it. Okay, if my wife disappoints me, if my sons disappoint me, uh, I am not going to strengthen myself in their words. That will be foolish. I will strengthen myself in the Lord. And the Lord will show it to me in His Word. And so I can love better. Because it's based on His Word. When you are manipulated by somebody that's very dear to you, then you cannot love them properly. Because you're already manipulated. That manipulation is fear-based. If you are operating in fear, you cannot operate in love. Okay. Do you believe that God is raising prophets at Lion's Heart? I know the answer to that. Uh, but you, you, heard, you heard my teaching on that one. But I'll tell you this. I, I, don't, want, I don't want to raise... Uh, the, the problem is this, Anne. When you begin to answer it affirmatively, people begin to be tempted with pride. I, I've seen people speak a little bit of prophecy and they, they think they are prophets. That's dangerous. I think I will take less of someone's advice. If you are a dog, stop saying you're a dog. Just bark. And everybody will know you're a dog. Okay? Now, if, you keep, if somebody starts saying, well, I think I'm a prophet, and my goodness, you have no measure of discernment, that's embarrassing. Okay, so I'd rather not answer it directly. Just put it this way. If you are a dog, you will bark. If you are not barking, you're probably a cat, okay? <laughs> Go ahead. Till death do we part is part of the marital vow. But is there a time when a marriage has to end? Well, that, the, the marital vow is actually <clears throat> a covenant. Covenant... Uh, ends in death. That's why the marital vow, because it's a covenant. 
but marriages that are marriages ends when you become unfaithful to the covenant. Um, unfaithfulness to the covenant at any given time ends the marriage. Because you become unfaithful. It's, it's not the signing of the little paper. It's, it's the covenant. That's why some couples are living in hell. Because the, the covenant is already violated. The moment that covenant, like, like for example, we may have argument, but our covenant is strong. It's never violated. Yeah. She had lost her ring so many times. And there were times that she'll be walking around without a ring. I never questioned her fidelity to our marital vow. Never. Yeah. Not even once. Uh, the, moment you, the, moment, the moment there is an, a bre breaking of the covenant, that marriage is ended. The only way it can be reconstructed is through repentance. And, and people overlook that without repentance, there is no forgiveness. By the way, one of the uh, definitions of forgiveness is the repairing of the bridge. That's why a priest is a bridge builder. You repair the bridge. You break that bridge, you repair that bridge. Now, when you pretend the bridge is not broken, you're going to fall off the cliff. And that's what most people do. They pretend it's, it's no, you're, you're going to get hurt even more. So when, when the covenant is violated, that practically ends the, the, the marriage. Uh, because one becomes faithful to the government. Now, can that be repaired? Yes. But there needs to be repentance. Uh, for, that, for, her, for, for there to be repentance, there's got to be hum humility. When you don't see those and you pretend it's okay, then you're self-deceived. It's not okay. What should we give to the poor? I remember you said we shouldn't be supporting what the devil does. So is it better to give food than money? Do you think they don't use the money we give for drugs, alcohol, etc.? So that they don't use the money that we give for drugs, I, I will alcohol, not concern et myself with that. I look at the poor and help the poor. Let me ask you this question. Do you, do you, you guys have money, right? Do you use 100% of that, that money uh, to good things? Now, nobody here is using their money 100% for good. Okay, we, we, uh, we misspend it sometimes. But the thing is this, if you begin to nitpick, you will not help anybody. I think you look at the poor and I'll help the poor. Okay, you talk about drugs and alcohol. Let's put it this way. This guy is very hungry. And I said, I'm gonna give you $20, I'll give you $100. This $100 is good. It's going to last you for one week. Within that week, you have food. You can find a job. Use this wisely. Well, he was, she was so hungry, she decided to go to a very good restaurant and finish all the food. Uh, fin finish 101 year, uh, in one meal. Did he misspend the money? She, yes, she did. She misspent the money. Was it an unwise use of funds? Yes, it is. Most people are guilty of that. Now, do I stop helping her? Instead of giving her $100, I'll just give her $5. No, it's my goodwill. Now, God gives us grace or gifts. Do, we re do you honestly think that anybody here can say, when God gives you a gift, that 100% you use it wisely? But God doesn't. God just gives us gifts. Now, if, <laughs> there is a point where God says, hold it. Like, like, look at the nation of Israel. They were already almost boxed in, and God is still sends rain. God is still blessed them. But there comes a point, enough! And it's cut off. Then they were exiled. And God was silent for 400 years. That breaking point, I do not know. When I help people, do they take advantage of me? Absolutely, yes. Do I feel bad? I feel bad for them, not for me. Okay? Because if they push me, there comes a point I back off. What I don't want uh, is for me to back off because I know I can help people. If I back off, I back off. You see? But do people take advantage of me? Yes, absolutely. And sometimes I smile when they think that I don't know that they're taking advantage. I know they're taking advantage of me. 
But that's not my concern. My concern is helping them. Now, if outrightly I know they're going to use it for drugs, of course I will not support that. If outrightly uh, they're going to use it for evil, I'm not going to. I'm not going to bless them. That's why I don't ask those questions. Now, if I see this person using it wrong and, and lying to me, then it becomes morally obligatory for me not to help. Okay. That's why I don't like asking that many questions. I see, I see a beggar on the street while driving my car. My wife will comment, look at this big dude, heavier than you. He should be working. But I will look at the beggar like that and I will take pity. I'll empty my coins and give it all to him and then drive away. That's what I do. I still do it to this day. <laughs> yeah, I still do it to this day. Will they use it for buying cigarettes? Sure. I don't ask that question, though. Will they use it for buying coffee? Yes. I don't ask that, though. Will that all be used for their good? No. Even as you don't, we don't use everything that God gave us for good. Let's, let's be real here, okay? That's just how we think. Go ahead. How do I handle a relationship where the other party chooses to leave you without a goodbye? I, I don't know what that means. I'm just reading it. Though. I have a partner in ministry in the Philippines, and the last meal that we have, he, he, wants, he wants to get back, but I lost trust in this person. Uh, Willie was with me during that time and three other guys, and I said, my, everybody said their goodbyes, and that guy looked at me, and I said, See you next time. And the guy turned around to walk away from me. And Willie was so offended. He said, did you see it? I said, don't bother. Yeah. Uh, I have had a lot of people walk out of me without saying goodbye. Does it minimize my life? No. Don't, some of these things don't take it too personally. <laughs> okay. They're, they're just, uh, they're just short-minded. Uh, instead of operating in 0.2%, maybe 0.02%, okay? But uh, people are like that. They, if, you, if you don't think people will not walk away with, from you without saying goodbye, you are hallucinating. They will. <laughs> By the way, you don't have to offend them. They will cause offense in their mind. They will walk away from you. Just believe me. A lot of people have walked away from me. If some, sometimes even after helping them so much, they'll walk away from you. That's just the way of the world, okay? You said that if your kids are still young, you would opt to do homeschooling with them because of the horrendous CPS agenda. Yes. If that is not an option for us, do you think moving in the public school suburbs where curriculum is a little better would be a good option? Suburbs curriculum is not a little better. You are misinformed. It has never been better. Chicago has the best uh, CPS uh, public school program, uh, I think, uh, in, in the market right now. Uh, the private schools are not, doesn't even come close unless they are heavily funded. But this is the thing. Even the private schools, the moment they are receiving federal money or state money, that's a polluted curriculum. It's just the way it is right now. I mean, that's why I think if you cannot... If you cannot do, because again, homeschooling demands that one of the parents supervise and they need to have the training to supervise. If they don't have the, acad the academic ability, what's the use of homeschooling? Uh, you cannot coach. Although I was told by some people who homeschool, there comes a point wherein if the child attains a certain level of uh, retention and understanding, they, they need very minimum supervision. If that is true, then that's an option. Otherwise, public school is like sending your kids to work. You have absolutely no control. It's, it's the way you train them and raise them up after they were born that now brings in the weight. Because, look, like us, our kids will be tempted. It's the weight. You know the word rebuke in the, in the Greek word, when you rebuke the devil? 
Well, it means it's, you put so much weight, it drops. Compare it to that. How much weight does the word of the Lord have on, on your life or on the life of your family? The word of the Lord has so much weight in my life, the other things drop. Well, I tempted in them, yes, but it dropped. It has to drop. Uh, I would like to think it's the same way with my kids. Where there are times my kids wants to disobey me all the time. Yeah, but, but the weight of the word in our relationship with each other has so much weight that they ultimately drop. Yeah. For example, Joseph is, is, uh, is stubborn, okay? He will have the most feisty argument with, uh, with my wife or even with me. We will be, we'll be arguing. And by the way, when we argue, we'll be raising our voices and just, but nobody takes it personal. We'll just be, and then, and then he, Anne will be upset and, and, and uh, everybody will be upset. At the end, the relationship bears its weight. And at the end, Joseph will just say, Mama, I love you. Okay, let's do that way. And he will look at me sometimes and says, the relationship is what carries the weight. You see? If that relationship is not established, and by the way, don't be afraid to test that relationship. If that relationship does not carry weight, then you need to invest more in that relationship. I have tested it uh, with my kids growing up. There were times I know that my idea is not super, superior. I'll just say that's what I like. And they will go, okay, okay, let's do it that way. And then I'll turn around and say, no, 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 let's do it this way. But I have seen that the weight of my relationship with my kids and the weight of the, of, and the, weight of the word of the Lord in their lives really carries a lot of influence. That's, that's uh, the opposite of the word rebuke. Uh, my relationship with my wife has so much weight that if I'm tempted by another girl, it will drop. Because my relationship with my kids is so strong I don't want to offend them. Can you imagine me going after another woman? It will offend all my kids so much, I cannot handle that. So, so my relationship with my kids is so heavy, temptations drop. I, I mean, to be honest, I don't entertain those things in my head. I just don't. Uh, because of the weight that my relationship with my family uh, bears on me. Okay, next. What is the biblical protocol for accountability, especially when it comes to those falling away from their faith or those that have not come back because of COVID? I've seen examples where people think accountability is pointing out all the wrongs of someone. Well, when, when you hold accountable somebody, of course you will see the wrong. But I, I think... Uh, the question has to define what falling away means. Falling away doesn't mean a person is backslidden. Okay? Uh, Tonight you will all fall away, Jesus said. None of them backslid except Judas. All of them return. Uh, falling away is a process. You see, one, one of the things that uh, we misunderstood is... Uh, uh, and, and by the way, it's part of being a child. A child is very strict. A child is very fundamentalist. Mom, you said this. No room to wiggle. Just, just totally fundamentalist. When an adult handles the case, the language changes. Okay? What I'm saying is this. There are so many reasons why a person leaves the church. For example, I have pers people who, who, uh, who said the right goodbye. They are out of state. Or, uh, there's no falling away there. Some people, uh, one, one, one person told me, I want to win my family. I said, you want to win your family and you're leaving the church? I said, that's opposite of the example. And, and they said, uh, yeah, they will not be won in this church because of you. I said, well, I, I, I accept that. Well, they, they left the church. The more they get separated from the Lord, you see. But the person loves God, you know. Uh, some people have... have uh, have different relationship problems. The only, the only thing, though, is in a church, I, I don't know where, where this devil comes from, 
but, but in, in a church setting like this, the most common group to blame, number one, is the church. Number two, the pastor. You know, some of you remember this leader that says, I reported him to DCFS or DCH, or DCRH or something. You know. uh, I did not report the guy, but I am the most convenient person to blame, really. I mean, because they will not blame you because you will keep uh, touch base with them on Facebook. You will keep inviting each other in parties, so they can't blame you. So they blame me uh, for reporting them to DCFS or something like that. I never did. It's, it's very convenient. Why? Because I'm not going to go after you. I, I will not knock on your door and, and confront you. I'm not going to do that. I'm not a child. You know, I just, I just recognize that you're going through difficulties in your life and you don't know how to handle it. But I don't look at you as box. I don't look at that person as box as box leader. Very different. The problem also to have is this: we don't we don't give time to others to muse upon their actions. When the prodigal son left, he did not stop becoming a son to the father. He stopped treating his father like his father, but he never stopped becoming a son to his father. But the father did not go after him. This is our problem. We have false concept of reconciliation. We force it all the time. Yeah. We just force it. You force it, you make the relationship uh, rip apart worse. Yeah. You, you give it the time to heal. So that boy lost, at first, he doesn't like his father until he realized his gold and silver started diminishing until he said they've got to find work well he found work uh, feeding hogs and then he wanted to eat the hog food and that was when he realized man if i am just a worker in my father's house i'll eat better how how long is that i do not know when i left the church people are forcing me to reconcile with the pastor those are foolish suggestions. Yeah, foolish suggestions. Lacking absolutely 100% in wisdom. I know better. Uh, I, I, tr I tried to tell Pastor King, my friend, not time. And he said, but James, Mark, and I respect James. I, I, I consider myself accountable to the guy, part of our family in the Philippines. So he said, you've got to meet with the, the pastor. I said, on account of your word, because we are friends, I will. But I said, please be in the middle. I know it wasn't time, but these guys think they know better. Well, he backed off. So a couple of years passed by, then three years. Then one day I walk in a courtroom. I walk in a courtroom, and I was supporting one client, and he's supporting another client. We saw each other in the metal detector, and the moment he saw me, after a couple of years, he extended his hand and said, oh, Pastor, say, I am very sorry. I said, no need for apology. I said, I have, I have no ill feelings against you. I said, I'm, I'm truly sorry. He said, please, can you forgive me? I said, I already forgave you. I said, nothing between us. That's it. You see, that started the healing. We saw each other twice here. Every time I see the guy, he keeps apologizing. Now this, after over 20 years, yeah. You think it's time for us to sit down now? Any time now is, re is ready. Yeah. People don't understand this. We, we for, um, an immature person will force matters. The moment you understand life, you will realize that some things need time. Uh, our pastor in the Philippines, big split power struggle in our church, Manila Bell Temple. They hit our pastor with a two by two, Filipino pastor. Two by two, in the pulpit. His son is a, a varsity wrestler for the University of the Philippines. The other one is a varsity basketball player, center for uh, the University of the East. These are big Italian guys. And when they hit his dad, this, this Italian wrestler is ready to pick up this, I'm bigger than the pastor, <laughs> ready to pick up, but the dad says, no, no, son, that's not your fight, that's mine. Leave it alone. So. Uh, the pastor left. They were not talking for over 30 years. Hurt, hurt uh, 
charter members of our church so bad. There was, but you know what happened? Everybody got old. Everybody got old. Around 30 years later, we organized the first pastor's Christmas banquet. We, we did it at Manila Peninsula Hotel. And what we did was uh, gather all of these pastors. I, we know they're fighting, but everybody got old. And I remember this pastor who hit my pastor in the head. He's coming from New York. He flew in and received the invitation. He's now over 70, going 80. And in the middle of the party, big Manila Pen ballroom, this old man stood up and approached this old lady, both of them grandparents now, and said, oh, Ching, she said, I am very sorry, he said. For over 30 years, I hurt you. Would you forgive? What are you going to do? These are two old grandparents. The time for reconciliation had come. They hugged like babies. They, they cried. And then, after a couple of weeks, he went back to New York, died. You see, people for decades have been forcing the reconciliation because they are foolish. They have no understanding on how these things work. Wounds heal in time. You see, that's why I, I have no, you know, we have, we have some people who, who, who left the church. Are they backslidden? Most of them not. A couple of them perhaps did. But most of them not. Uh, they're struggling with sin. They're struggling with other issues. But most of them are not. I wish they, I pray for them that they'll find a church. Will there, be a, will, will there ever be a time uh, of a sit down? Yeah. Not now. You know, uh, I think when I'm 80 years old and dying, then they will have the heart to meet me, you know. But all, all, all of us get old. And when you get old, will you have the energy to fight? You just surrender. Okay, hug. At least, don't, don't force a things. Uh, learn from the prodigal parable, you know. Next. How does one know if he or she is meant for single blessedness? Is there a time or age when you stop hoping to be married? Well, when, when you don't get married. Not, everyone, not everybody who is called, not, not, well, let's put it this way. Everybody is called to be married. I mean, you look at the scriptures. We are called to be married. You start with that. Some will not be married for different reasons. You just cope with that. You know? uh, and there's a million reasons why. Some are forced not to be married. For example, the eunuchs. Do they like uh, their balls to be cut off? No. But because of that, they will, not, they will not be married anymore. You see? Some are thrown into slavery. Some have been mangled physically. They can't be married. Do they still have a desire? Yes. Because when a person is born, there is this natural desire for communion with persons of the opposite sex. Look at Genesis. That's our frame. It takes a special situation for a person not to be married. Some don't get married uh, by choice. They just don't like other people. Some have abrasive personalities. They are porcupines. It will take another porcupine for them to get along. That's just, you know, it sounds funny, but that is just the way it is, you know. Uh, but initially, our design is to be with somebody. You start with that, okay? Uh, and I don't know if the term single blessedness is appropriate. I think, I think you just say single, you know. Uh, that will be more appropriate. Go ahead. All indicators show that the U.S. is right now in recession. What advice can you give regarding management of our finances, including our employment? Keep your employment, you know. <laughs> if, if you are employed, keep it. If you are not employed, rush to find one. This is not going to get any easier. The only country right now that is already uphill is India. Okay, China 
is losing tons of money. Uh, the U.S. have given direct deposit to a tune of $1 trillion for COVID-19. I mean, did we receive any check? We did not. We are not part of that. But, but uh, on direct deposit, some of you have received money. $1 trillion. The total package that the U.S. government has given away as a result of COVID, anybody know? You have no idea. $5 trillion. You should, you should keep yourself updated with these things. The U.S. have given $5 trillion. Without industry, where do you think is that money coming from? That's why we are in a recession. So this is the time wherein cash is king. If you are employed, keep that employment by all means. Enslave, literally enslave yourself to your boss so that your boss will keep liking you. Because the moment you leave that job, that's out. Second, if you can find employment, I don't care what it is, take it. Because uh, in history, when something like this happened, Christians suffer because we're part of this world. So keep that. Don't spend unnecessarily. You know, if, if you don't need to spend the money, don't spend it. When you spend the money, spend it wisely. Don't, don't squander it. Uh, that's why, for example, even with this missions thing, uh, look, we're, we're still pushing for uh, how much per meal because we know I cannot let this go out of whack. Otherwise, we lose our missions money just like that. We have money for a good down payment for a, for a good piece of land in the Philippines. I'm not going crazy about it. You know, uh, I spend, the, the money that I spend in the Philippines this time, well, I spent pesos. I did not change any dollar. Why? Dollar just rise up now to 57. Why? Because I understood that. Peso is weaker. By the way, even the European dollar went below the, the U.S. dollar. The moment you understand that dollar, the U.S. dollar is very strong right now. So if you have a dollar, you keep it right now. Okay? That's why I spend, I thank God for the blessing of the pay, I spend all the pesos in the Philippines. And, and I, there's a couple of pastors that I would like to bless. I gave them dollars because they, they, they need it for something. So I give them dollars, not, not, not the pesos, because if they don't spend right away, at least it will not lose value for a period of time. You see, these are understandings of, of money that, that, that you need to have. Uh, other than that, and then of course on top of that, you, you live by faith, you, you believe God for, for the best, you know. Next. Are you in favor of families living together? Parents moving in, aging parents moving in with their kids, or adult children moving back home with their parents? Well, first of all, aging parents moving back with the kids, I, I, think, I think you have to, to put it at a very poor condition because normally in the, in, the, in the Bible, the parents are established, they have their houses, the kids who stay with them, okay? By, by force right now, in fact, the construction is going on in American families right now. American families are, are doing construction because they are hosting their children back in the house. Okay? The, the best way to do it is just like that. If, if families can, can, can be together and, and chip in, by the way, and chip in. That's how the Mexicans beat the last recession. Chip in. Uh, everybody should carry their own weight. That's how you beat this time. Uh, years ago, if you remember, the reason why I built that big house is I said, so that in the future, if our families in the U.S. needs a place of refuge in difficult times, there is a place. That's why the next thing I'm, I'll finish after this is, is, uh, is the basement because I have enough place for my family. Okay, but everybody should carry their own weight. Uh, this is a time to consolidate. Even the American families are consolidating. I tell you, most of the American families constructed, expanding their rooms, making additions to bring in their kids, and they're chipping in. So you beat this. How long is this gonna last? I do not know. 
uh, again, the only country right now that uh, the, the most uh, the most uh, hit is actually Europe. Second is the U.S. I think third is Japan. But the one recovering very well right now is India. India, by the way, just secured a new contract with Apple. They will start manufacturing uh, iPhone 14. Yeah, India is. What, what India did is opposite of what the rest of the world, they're giving money, right? India did not do that. They start giving food, a little cash. What they did is they start investing in their economy. For example, when they bought food, they bought their own products. Yeah. So they did not allow the people to just spend their money. They bought the food and gave it to the people. So they put in, in the economy. So India is the country right now that is really doing well on the way to recovery. U.S. is squandered it the most. Five trillion dollars. Imagine five trillion dollars. Guys, you think, you, you think that's just going to be a race? No, our great, 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 till Jesus comes, our great, great grandchildren will be paying for it. You know? and, and this administration, instead of the wise things, put the, the manufacturing in, whew, Look, Jessica planted a lot of plants in our backyard. You, you think we are buying vegetables? We're not spending money on those vegetables. We're just picking them from the backyard uh, and, and, and using them. Yeah. Uh, fruits we're buying, but vegetables, we're not spending on it. Yeah. You, you save as much. A little piece of plant, plant camote in there, you know, and, uh, and, and do something. But... I, now, everybody don't go visit by their Willie's house because they have a lot of plants there. But that's the wise way. Every little thing that you can save money on, you know, uh, save, save money on. That's, that's how you do it. Okay. What is your opinion on the open border policy of Biden? Is it okay to allow illegal immigrants to enter or stay in our country? Even in the Bible, that's not right. You'll find that there are border uh, limitations in the Bible. Uh, the Bible opens us for strangers. By the way, those strangers, those aliens, if you look at the scriptures, they are normally victims of famine, movements like that. But other than that, they are restricted. The reason why it is wrong is because we don't have the money. <laughs> you bring in 200,000 immigrants, who's going to pay for it? Again, I was, somebody was telling me yesterday that the health care of the new immigrants that Abbott brought in Chicago is better than most of us have. We are paying for it 100% and we don't have one. Yeah. That is totally unfair. By the way, over 20 years ago, I told you this. Nationalism is, I told you this, this congregation over 20 years ago, I said, I saw it 20, over 20 years ago. I said, nationalism is going to return to the U.S. It's over 20 years ago in the pulpit. I keep saying that. It has returned. Uh, out of prostrations, you should see some powerful white men and black men deal with Asians. Very different now. I mean, they, they can be very rude. Why? Because you have to remember they abandon education. The educated people are the Asians. They resent that now. It should not have happened that way if the government did not, did not export of all of our manufacturing. But they did all of these grievous mistakes because they're spending money. The reason why the government is spending money like crazy, they don't earn it. They don't earn it. The reason why our kids spend so much money, they're not earning it. That's just the way it is. When you're not earning something, you want to spend it. Okay? So uh, pu put some discipline. I totally disagree with it. I think the border should be closed. And the, uh, the, the bad thing that is happening is they are now discovering some Russians crossing the border. That is dangerous because Putin uh, is very angry with the U.S. I'm not sure about those Russians coming in. Is it wrong for me to suspect that? No. That's the right way to suspect right now. I mean, that's just the way it is. I think it should be closed. I think they should have continued the walls. Let the world criticize us uh, because... That's survival. Understand, the U.S. is not the Philippines. It has 300 million spoiled citizens with guns. That is very difficult to tame. Philippines, 
you can tame it easier. But not the U.S. This is a big monster that requires to be fed. All the, the most obese country. We eat five times more food than the rest of the world, guys. Five times more. This is a spoiled country that just spent unearned five trillion dollars. Okay, so I disagree with that 100%. Go ahead. What kind of headquarters or building are you envisioning for Lion's Heart in the Philippines? I think with what I saw from my brother-in-law's house, I think I will settle for a little over than 500 square meter. A thousand will be good. I'll dig a basement with a lot of parking space. Uh, this is what I'm in, in, in envisioning, okay? The first floor will be for rental. It has to generate some income. It will be commercial. And then second floor will be an assembly hall, and then there's going to be a third floor. There's going to be a residence there uh, that will, that will uh, host the missions team uh, that will be coming, okay? Uh, like, like that. That is what I'm looking for, uh, the most ideal. It, it has to be a secured neighborhood. It's because of the kind of goods that we'll be moving in. If you put it in a depressed neighborhood, it will be open for thievery. There's got to be some measure of security. Realistically, we will need to fund all of this around 100 million pesos right now. Yeah, 100 million pesos. Uh, we have around 5 million that I can spend right away. Uh, we're looking into uh, avenues uh, wherein we can buy the property fr from an owner who lives here. Okay? Uh, and that is open now. That, that, uh, that is for a big, uh, good building construction. But you, you know as well as I do how construction is in the Philippines. You can build the first floor or the second floor and then leave the, let the top open and you will have occupancy permit while it is being built as the funds goes. That is a benefit that we have in the Philippines. Uh, but the moment we start something like that, and I have been discussing this with my wife. Man, the, the first, I've got to spend at least six months there right away, perhaps, if it's constructed. If there's a building already, at least three months there right away. You, you have to have some supervisions right away. Uh, so we, we're believing God. I'm not anxious, but prices are dipping right now, so it's an exciting time uh, to, to be open to that. I, I, that's why I'm telling you, if you know somebody, in Metro Manila is the preferred place for me, open middle of transportation. If you know somebody with around 100 square meter, perhaps, uh, with a small building that's preferable, so we can, we can put something there right away. But uh, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, his, her brother already promised he will help us with the construction because Ahmed knows how to build cheaply. I mean, he's building a house right now, and I was asking him how he did it cheaply, but very good. Uh, architecture. Uh, I'm not, I'm, it, it gave me a lot of ideas. Because originally I was thinking of several hectares, but no more now. It can be done. Uh, the more you open yourself to ideas, uh, the more we'll be prepared for the project. Yes. Okay, it's 9.03. That's it. Thank you so for your questions, Sansel. Praise God. That's all, Stan.